Good evening, and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Mark Axon, and I welcome you tonight for another half-hour discussion of current events and politics from a libertarian perspective. Tonight, my guest is Ronald Ramo. Ron is a recent graduate of Turo Law School, recently passed the bar exam. However, rather than rushing off to the uh, law courts, Ron has decided to do something a little different. He's running for Congress. Ron, welcome to Hard Fire. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. So, Ron, let's get right into it. Mm -hmm. Why are you running for Congress? Well, I'm running for Congress for many reasons. I think the issue with government is that it's so pervasive in our lives, and sometimes a little more subtle, sometimes much more uh, prominent. For instance, our beds, they're regulated the way they're made by government, trans transportation, even our food that we eat. Everything has some sort of government regulation uh, attached to it. So it's something that's always fascinated me. And another issue I find um, that takes my mind is that we live in an era where the libertarian perspective, the idea of freedom, of less government, isn't very much touted in the political realm. And I hope to bring that alternative to the public. So this will be an opportunity for you to bring the message of freedom to out to the public. And exactly who is that public that you'll be speaking to? Well, I am running for Congress in the 6th District uh, of New York that is located in Queens. It uh, encompasses such uh, neighborhoods as Arverne, South Ozone Park, South Richmond Hill, uh, St. Albans, parts of Jamaica, Elmont, Belrose, Kew Gardens, and the Far Rockaways. And have you lived in that area for a long time? I've lived there since I was born in 1982. And you went to school in Flushing, and then you were in the uh, in the Scouts. I know you made it all the way up to Eagle Scout, and uh, then you went to Turo Law School. So you're really a, a a local guy running for Congress. And and who would you be running against? Uh, the current incumbent, his name is Gregory Meeks. He's been an incumbent since 1998. Before that, he was a member of the state assembly. And before that, he was a special prosecutor for narcotics for the Queen's DA. So basically a professional statist. So he's certainly not going to bring the freedom message out to the public. I'm very doubtful. <laughs> and uh, what kind of congressman has he been? He, well, um, from my research, recently he's been, getting under, uh, he's been getting much flack for chronic absenteeism as well as for certain travel issues relating to lobbying. Uh, so he's taking the money, but he's not even doing the work, which may be a good thing if they don't <laughs> do the work in Congress, but, yeah. but he's clearly taking the money. And why would the voters want to vote for you? What kind, what kind of alternative message are you about to present to them? Well, I think as an alternative, I think the libertarian alternative is something that most Americans are interested in to some extent. We, we're, we come from a society and a culture that encourages uh, self-responsibility, self-reliance, individualism. Uh, we, we call America the land of opportunity because we have such an open market economy and those are things that we want to, I, I think, that need to be addressed in the upcoming election. And do you believe that the individuals in that district would be receptive to this message? I think it's just a, I think there's certainly going to be swaths of people in any district that would be interested in the message and it's just a matter of presenting it and arguing it, I think, that is the real issue. Well, maybe just because it's different from what the uh, typical statist uh, nanny state. We'll take care of you. We'll protect you. you know, we'll do it all for you. Just give us your taxes and let us do everything for you. It's a, it's a nice uh, breath of fresh air for them to hear something about freedom and individuality. As I, opposed I completely to agree. It, someone has to say that the proper phrase is not better living through big government. It's better living through less government. All right, so um, Meeks is a Democrat. Are, th are there Republicans in this district? Do they, do they the even exist? The Republican Party it does exist in the district. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the few Queens Republicans in the state Senate is from the 6th District, uh, uh, from the, the South Ozone Park, Howard Beach area of the district. However, it's not been a very potent Republican Party, and since 1998, when it was an open election, uh, when Floyd Flake had retired to take on pastoral in his church, it's the Republicans have not put up a candidate since then. So are you considering running as a Republican as well as a Libertarian? Uh, I'm entertaining the idea and I actually am right now trying to gain as much of a grassroots uh, support as I can so that if I do seek the uh, nomination of the Republicans, I can do it on my own terms as opposed to theirs. Well, that would be much better. But clearly you're going to run as a Libertarian candidate. So I know that entails, and I've been involved in a party for <coughs> almost 20 years, and, mm -hmm. and as, you, as you know, it's, it's constant petitioning because 
the, the, uh, the two-party system has set the election law up in New York State specifically so they can remain in power mm -hmm. and, and any challengers from the outside or, or immediately stymied by outrageous uh, uh, requirements and the petitioning, et cetera. So if people want to get involved in helping you and to set up this grassroots, what can they do? Well, I can be contacted in several different ways. Uh, currently, I have a website. It's still under construction a little bit. It's ramoforcongress.com. Can you spell that for me? Uh, R-A-M-O, the number four, Congress, C-O-N-G-R-E-S-S, -S, dot com. Okay. That's our website. You can contact me by email at ron at ramoforcongress dot com. Mm -hmm. And also, I have a MySpace for uh, a lot of the people out there who are into the whole Web 2.0 phenomena. It's uh, MySpace dot com forward slash Ramo, the number four, Congress. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what would happen when you get into Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I guess mostly we should start talking about some of the issues that you're going to find because right. this last Congress has really been, um, to be charitable, has been an incredible disappointment. If you think about it, and I mean, I don't think George Bush even vetoed anything for the first seven years. And between the, the, the do nothing rubber stamp Congress that, you know, oh, well, you need more money for Afghanistan, you need more money for Iraq, you need more money for nation building, you need more money for mm -hmm. this. That. I mean, it's really, been, it's really been a joke. So what, what different kind of perspective would Ron Ramo bring if he were in Congress? I think I'd bring a, a perspective that's different in three different ways. Uh, first, I, as an outsider, I think I would have a, an opportunity to give a more forthright and honest opinion on the programs that, that are passed and made legislation. I think a lot of legislators have a bias for programs that, that are usually started with well intentions, but when the intentions don't happen to turn into results, they, their biases prevent them from actually repealing or defunding those programs. Uh, I think that, and also and as the I nature and the nature of any of these programs is, as soon as you start them, they just build and build and build and get bigger and bigger and well, bigger. Okay, well, if you look at it this way, it's. Because it comes back to the bias of the legislator. It's like, well, it's not working because it's not funded enough. Give it more money. Give it more bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Give it more regulations. It's never, maybe it just wasn't meant to happen that way in the first place. Maybe humans are just like cats. We can't be herded. Mm -hmm. So are you going to be uh, uh, like uh, Ron Paul, Dr. No in Congress, where he just votes no on, on any of these spending bills that aren't specifically authorized by the Constitution or by uh proper... Uh, 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 natural law theory. I, I think it goes, yes, I, I agree. It goes beyond just the Constitution because the Constitution in many ways ha has been perverted, uh, sometimes I would say perverted, sometimes just broadly interpreted to in allow a lot of these programs. I would go beyond just uh, looking at the Constitution, but as from a libertarian perspective, uh, determining and asking myself what is good public policy on the federal level? And whether, and if my own opinion, I don't think a particular program is beneficial or I don't think it's going in the right direction even though it may have started as a good idea to reduce funding to reform it to do something other than just stick with the status quo and the idea that it just needs more to work right well let's talk about some of those programs um, uh, we'll, let's start with the third rail we might as well jump right in uh, social security there's a program that was set up for you know <coughs> the widows and orphans back in in the, in uh, Roosevelt's time, mm -hmm. uh, there were probably I think there were eight or nine contributors to the program for every one recipient. Mm -hmm. uh, you, most people didn't receive Social Security till they were 65, mm -hmm. and the median lifespan in the United States was 69. So maybe there was four or five years that people were going to receive, right. and 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 half of the Americans would have been deceased. Well, now with better health care, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. People are living well into their 90s. People are collecting Social Security for 30 years, and that Ponzi scheme is starting to collapse. So what would your position be on, on the Social Security system? Well, I, I have to agree with you. I think, uh, from what I understand, uh, by 2016, uh, Social Security will be in dire straits, if not bankrupt, as uh, the continuing loss of workers over the next several years will reduce from the current 3 to 1 ratio of three workers per every uh, recipient to two to one ratio. Mm -hmm. I think what needs to happen is a twofold effect. Of course, I understand I'm very supportive of the libertarian idea that we need a totally privatized social security system, a retirement system to be more accurate. However, I don't think it's something the public is willing to receive at this moment, and it has to be incrementally introduced to them. And just as much as we've been convinced incrementally that we need bigger government to have better lives, 
incrementally convince people that less government, more personal responsibility, more, as I like to call it, individual empowerment, gives us a better life. The first thing I would like to put forward is that the, 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 social, the social security trustees should be able to diversify the portfolio beyond uh, the current restrictions only having uh, U.S. Uh, debt. Okay, but the first time they invested in some um, hedge fund and the stock goes down or the uh, or they put it in some, you know, um, uh, you know, junk bonds or whatever to get a high yield, and, and and it goes. The next thing you'll hear is the free market failed. That was the problem. It was the fault of going into the free marketplace. And so I would be very wary about having these trustees investing the funds. Why don't we? Why don't we just let uh, individuals? Uh, you're you're in your mid twenties. Why don't we let individuals of your age group just keep your own money? rather than, and be responsible for your own retirement, rather than Joe paying for Jim, paying for Jack, paying for, for Jill, paying for all these other people who we don't even know. I completely agree with you in many respects, and actually the second prong of my entire uh, my plan would be to allow, uh, it's a poor word to use, but in the current context, it's the one I can only, the only one I can think of, allow, enable, permit uh, people under the age of 30 to re keep a, uh, a substantial portion of their own uh, Social Security tax so that they can actually invest it themselves as a way to hedge against the fact that Social Security may be bankrupt by 2016, if not earlier or so, even later. So you'd let people opt out and maybe even keep that 12.6 percent of their income that the government is stealing every uh, week out of their paychecks. That would be good. Um, what, let's move on to another issue. What about um, the, the military? Right now, our uh, government is, uh, <coughs> is protecting us in something like 140 different countries across the world, uh, maintaining a force not only in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan, which obviously the most recent, but I think we've had soldiers in Korea now for about 55 years. We have, we've been the policemen of the world, and we've been stopping those commie dominoes from falling very, very effectively, as you can as you can say, for many, many years. So, mm. what what should be the right? Le what should be the legitimate role, if any, of the United States military? Should there be a U.S. military, and if so, what should its what should its function be? Well, my view is that the current foreign policy that we have, uh, being in so many different countries around the world, it's not good for us. It's it uh, only allows people who have anti-American sentiments to build enough propaganda to then sell it to people who may be on the fence or may normally not even think the, the issue of why is America in my country. It's very easy uh, for a person who has an anti-American sentiment, no matter how irrational it may be, to actually rationalize it and even sell it to other people. And I think uh, when you look at a lot of the places that we are in currently, it's, it's a Cold War relic. Uh, why are we still in Germany, in Italy? We have no, there's no threat of the, the Soviet, the, the now defunct Soviet Union. Uh, <laughs> Uh, crossing over I don't, East Germany and starting to wreak havoc. Uh, you look other places like South Korea. They, although there are some people who appreciate the presence of the United States there, most people don't. It, it, it's a sad fact uh, that no one, no one in South Korea thinks of the United States as its protector or its buddy as much as it used to. And, and it actually only helps uh, Kim, jo uh, Kim Jong-il get more support in the South and sees the, the United States as the reason that the Koreas are divided and not nothing to do with the fact that he's a totalitarian madman. Yes. All right. Well, should, do we have a role fighting these totalitarian madmen? And which ones do we pick? Do we go against Kim? Do we go against um, uh, Robert Mugabe? Do mm -hmm. we go? I mean, I know for many, many years, and in, in our parents' generation in particular, they were often talking about you know Castro, and you know Castro himself is no longer a threat, although his country clearly is. To us, uh, we have uh, a new a new tyrant in Venezuela making a lot of noise. You know, he did have one good comment though. I think he called uh, George Bush El Diablo <laughs> in the UN. So, so I mean, he once in a while uh, Chavez gets it right. But other than that, uh, mm -hmm. we have all of these tyrants. Which ones should we be going after, or, or if any? Well, I think the United States. An interesting article I've actually read very recently is that. Guns is not what pr transports freedom around the world. It's free trade. It's being able to communicate with people and to do business with them. And, it ha and when that happens, when that happens, ideas get exchanged, goods get exchanged. People start wondering, you know, it's great that I live in this police state, but how come I can't own that nice pair of jeans like everybody else? 
And that's what, and if you look at history, that is what's going to be the, 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 the fact I think that'll prevail is we beat the Soviet Union not so much by outspending them, which certainly did help, but we were able to outspend them because we were much more of a free market society and willing to trade with others, while the Soviets were much more closed minded and unwilling to trade with people who weren't their uh, blood brother allies. Well, this is a very good point. I've heard it t uh, discussed about um, the relationship between Hong Kong and mainland China. Mm -hmm. And as Hong Kong comes in, that they'll win the battle because they're going to bring in market capitalism, which, you know, although they're not that interested <coughs> in civil liberties, they're clearly very, very interested in capitalism in Hong Kong. And you see it in Shanghai, which, of course, is on, main, on the mainland. Mm -hmm. It was a city that was uh, just waiting to erupt with business opportunities. They're, they're just seizing upon it, and Shanghai is being built now by leaps and bounds. Well, you have to, uh, history also shows that sh before Hong Kong was the major economic powerhouse in East Asia, before uh, the mainland turned to the Soviet uh, communist, I don't know what you would call it, a uh, black hole, Shanghai was the financial capital of East Asia. I, especially in China, at least, on the mainland. And it's returning back it, to that prominence. So this argues in favor of free trade and free association and communication and fr open travel and communication between the countries and not necessarily oc sending occupying forces to their countries with, with guns and weapons, et cetera, and telling them which way to cross the street and where they go and where they can't go. I, I, again, I agree with you completely. And it, it, what it comes back down to is, the freedom of the the idea of freedom not only is that we are free to do whatever we want, but we're free to associate in a way that we find politically expedient. Some people believe in their political associations. In some countries, they want a little more authority than others. Well, the question, of course, is should we be imposing our our uh, way of thinking on them? Quite frankly, I think that a lot of these countries out there are absolute horror shows, and they and it's not that I'm in favor of democracy over. Um, uh, the, the son of the last king becoming the next king. It's, it's just the, the idea of, pre of preventing freedom, preventing uh, liberty to such a huge extent is so, uh, so pervasive in these countries that that is a, a real problem. But is it right for the United States to be going into those countries and imposing our will on them? Or is it better for the United States to try to be trading with them, to try to be communicating with them, to try to show them this is the way that we do it. We do it where we honor the individual, where we allow individuals to make their own decision. And maybe that's a, a, a better way of doing it. Um, let me move on to a couple of other okay. subjects, just because we uh, our time is limited and we, there's so much that you're going to be doing once you get into that Congress. Um, what about the immigration situation now? I know that there is a tremendous call in Congress now to be putting up, you know, fences along the border, and you know we're going to we're going to shoot every Mexican as he co tries to come in and and you know maybe earn an honest living and you know, clean the floors and wipe the cars and become a busboy and a, maybe then a waiter and maybe own a mm -hmm, restaurant, mm -hmm. send some money home to his family. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those heinous things that these horrible, horrible immigrants <laughs> want to do. You know, and in some way, I under, I, uh, you bring up a very good point. In one respect, I, I completely agree. I think uh, the idea of a much more open immigration policy is certainly, I think, beneficial to everyone. And I think that uh, certain reforms need to be made to the current immigration policy of the United States so that uh, people have to jump through less hoops in order to get to the United States. However, I do believe that there should be some minimum uh, requirements, at least making yourself present, you know, going, hi, my name is XYZ, I would like to come to the United States, even if that's just the minimum. Because I think uh, there are genuine concerns we have as to we want to prevent uh, criminals evading justice in their home countries to come here as some kind of safe haven. Mm -hmm. We're, we, we certainly, um, I mean, as much as it's, it's doubtful or skeptical in many people's minds, we, we certainly still have a, a sincere concern, perhaps, uh, about infiltration through our borders, whether legally or illegally, uh, by people who wish to commit terrorist attacks in the United States. And I think the last thing that we may be concerned with is people coming into the United States that may have infectious disease. These are three things, I think, that anyone who wants to come to the United States should just be at least willing to have themselves a very minimum background check or health examination, and that's it. Uh, moving on from that, I think another interesting point, uh, in my own opinion, mm -hmm. is that a lot of people, I think, are angry at the idea of immigration when what they're really concerned about is the American culture, uh, the ideas of freedom, liberty, uh, our background, our history. 
and, and I think the real problem here is that government has mandated through our education system and through other policies uh, an ideology that if you speak out against other cultures that seem to be contrary to the American ideal, then you're a racist or you're closed-minded or bigoted. And this is the real problem, I think, facing us um, in this generation in the quote-unquote uh, culture wars. Mm. Okay, well, you mentioned a few things there, and the question also about uh, criminal justice came up. And in particular, how do we deal with the criminal justice system here in the United States, as opposed to the problem of potential um, when Castro emptied the jails and sent all the criminals north? The, besides that issue, what do we deal with people in our, in our jails now? And of course, one answer from a libertarian perspective, of course, is that if you eliminate the drug laws, you're going to eliminate an awful lot of, of unnecessary incarceration. So I know that, that that's an obvious one, but what else would you do? Well, the other thing I think is, um, I've been inspired by this from my own reading of the Libertarian Platform, uh, relating to how we should re reform the penal system to be more compensatory to the victims and their families. And I think one way to do that, at least on a federal level, is that uh, federal criminals who commit violent crimes, uh, murders, manslaughters, assaults, batteries, rapes, thefts. And most of those are state crimes, but they're, they do happen some sometimes on the interstate level. You, you have mm -hmm. people who run state borders and then okay. get well, please caught continue. up, what have you. But that these people who are in this system for violent crimes should be used as a, as a, as a labor resource. And the, the value that's generated by their labor is given as compensation to the victims. I, one of my other inspirations for this idea is uh, Thomas More's Utopia, when he said that the idea of executing people for petty crimes or all crimes is, is kind of nonsensical, because when a person is driven to the desire to break a law when, the face of, when they face death, that is not the, that's not going to be a disincentive for them. However, if you keep them around and you actually make them have to toil the rest of their life in payment for the crime to the victim, no less, there's a stronger sense of deterrence because it's not like if you fail, you're gone. It's if you fail, you must suffer the rest of your life. So how much government would we have in, in, in an ideal state? I mean, you mentioned utopia, and utopia, of course, is actually a bit of a A, a bit social, of a statist uh, yeah, uh, track. Say, I'll yeah, give you that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think that, uh, I mean, Moore is a very interesting uh, character, but I don't know that he's a, uh, a true libertarian hero. But, uh, I mean, some of what he wrote is, is really fascinating. But, but, Agreed. But in an in, in a, in a, in a ideal libertarian state, how much government would we have? And then how would we fund it? We'll talk about taxation as our last uh, of, these, mm. of these subjects. Well, I think I'm not so absolutely certain where how much government we should have. I know for just for a fact though we have much too of it, much too much of it. And I certainly I think if I were to be elected to Congress, one of my goals would be certainly to reform at least on the federal level how much government pervades us with this one size fits all cookie cutter policies that are made in ca on Capitol Hill in the White House and in the alphabet soup. Uh, bureaucracies. Well, Ron, one way, of course, to, to, to be fighting that is to support libertarian causes. Absolutely. And if our viewers are interested in the Libertarian Party and finding out more about the Libertarian Party, then we invite our viewers to get on the website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. That's www.manhattanlp.org, the official website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party, where there will be uh, information about upcoming events, and various links to um, the uh, Surf City, our newspaper, and our blog, and a link to this fine television show, Hardfire, where you can see other uh, topics of discussion on libertarian events in addition to uh, tonight's. So again, that is www.manhattanlp.org, the official website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. Ron, we only have a couple of minutes left. Tell me some of the party, some of the problems that you would have as a third party candidate and what you would do to address them. Well, I think one of the, the biggest problems for any third party candidate is the issue of name recognition. A person can have great ideas, people can agree with the ideas, but if they can't put the ideas to the name, they're not going to vote for that person on the ballot. And I think also name recognition is also very important, as you were saying earlier about petition requirements, Getting 3,500 uh, people to sign 
a piece of paper for someone you have no idea who they are is very difficult. And is that what you need? You need 3,500 valid signatures There's in a six-week period, and they've got to be in your district, and, and you've got to have them identify their, their home, and if they don't cross the T's and dot the I's, then the Democrats or the Republicans, depending on which one wants to challenge you this week, mm -hmm. will be out there you know, questioning your petitions, and the Board of Elections will be only, t which is made up of Democrats and Republicans, surprise, <laughs> surprise, would only be ready to kick you out. So that is that is a problem that you would have as as a um, as a candidate. Okay, we still have another minute or two well, left. The, well, so I want to me. say one of the few things I'm trying to do right I'm trying to do right now to increase my name recognition is I'm trying to use uh, web the the newer facilities on the web such as MySpace, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, these are websites that post uh, videos or give profiles of people to interact with other people's social networking, as well as a website. And hopefully I can, gen as I was saying earlier, generate something of a grassroots support this way, um, a la, dare I even say, Ron Paul. And hopefully that will give me uh, some amount of grassroots support so that when push comes to shove and petition time comes around and even closer to election time, there will be a number of people who are willing to speak about me, hand out flyers, get signatures, etc. So again, why don't you give us your website so that if viewers want to get involved with your campaign, they know how to contact you and how to contact uh, and or how to uh, look up your website and look up you. What is the uh, number again on that? Oh, the website is www.ramo or the number four congress.com. Okay, and that would be, uh, and in addition, you also had Ron at Ramo for congress.com. Congress. Com. Yes, as as certainly an email. email is. Email me as much as you'd like, uh, ideas, suggestions, volunteering. I'm receptive to all of it. Okay, and I'm sure you'll also be receptive to campaign contributions yes. once you set that up. Uh, Absolutely. You have to, you, I know that um, I was the treasurer on a federal campaign for Senate last year, and mm -hmm. so I know there's a tremendous amount of work on that. Well, Ron, thank you so much, Ron Ramo, for chatting with me and chatting with our viewers tonight. For Mark, it's all, always a pleasure. Uh, all the all the work that you'll be doing. And viewers, thank you for watching us tonight at Hardfire. Please join us next week for another exciting issue of Hardfire. Thank you and good night. Hardfire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York, www.ny.lp.org. Catering for the cast and crew of Hardfire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.